Shortly after finishing up Ravel's old 148th EA6A, I got inspired to continue to build some of the kits that I grew up building as a kid. One, to confirm that old kits can still be good, and two, to kind of reconnect to the past and remind myself why I got into this great hobby in the first place. The 148th Monogram P39 has been around for over 50 years. I remember being fascinated with the box cover as a kid. I loved the Hell's Bells markings, and the ability to display the model all opened up. I figured it would be fun to try another old kit to see how it would look when finished with some modern building techniques and equipment. Pretty hard to believe that the kit is over a half a century old. Despite its age, it still builds into a really nice model. Let's first take a quick look at the overall kit contents. The box art features a built model that shows the open gun bay, engine bay, and starboard side door. The sides of the box show even more of those details, as well as providing a brief description of the aircraft. You can see that the first release was back in 1963, and this particular version represents the second release in 1973. Check out all of the detail that's available right out of the box. Let's take a look inside. The instructions are classic monogram. The cover page provides illustrations for all of the variants that can be built with this particular boxing. The instructions really take you back. They have outstanding illustrations and step-by-step -step instructions. You can see all of the parts that are used for each of the respective variants. There are painting guides for each of those variants as well. I've always had a soft spot for the Hell's Bells P400 markings. One big worry was whether or not the decals would still be usable. Taking a quick look at them straight from the box shows that they still have good color after all these years. The parts are molded in dark green plastic. The shape looks spot on to me and the parts feature fine raised panel lines and rivet detail. You can see the right side engine compartment with molded in details. The wing parts are equally as nice as are the cockpit details. The only concern I had was with the softly molded in harnesses and belts on the pilot's seat. The main wheel bays have some really nice molded in detail, as does the cockpit floor and the main cannon. The clear parts are well molded and still very clear. This really looks like it's going to be a great blast from the past kind of project. So let's get started. I start by clipping off the cockpit parts from the sprues and sanding off the rough edges using a combo 220-400 sanding pad. You can find a link to the sanding pads along with other materials used in this build in the video description below. I often paint most parts while they're still attached to the sprues, but I decided to do a little assembly of the cockpit prior to painting on this particular build. I added the rear bulkhead but left out the armored glass until later in the build sequence. I glued it to the cockpit floor using Tamiya Superfine Thin Cement. To make sure that the bulkhead dried in the right position, I temporarily installed it into the fuselage and closed it up until the bulkhead had dried in place. As is typical for my cockpits, I start with painting all of the parts with a priming coat of flat black. In this case, to me is acrylic flat black. I give all of the cockpit parts a good coat that serves to help create depth and dimension when I add the interior green later. After I have all the interior parts primed with the flat black, I mix up some interior green using a 50-50 mixture of Tamiya Flat Green and Tamiya Yellow Zinc Chromate. I spray this over the flat black, but limiting how much I apply to the areas where shadows would be present. I apply the mixture to both the left and right fuselage halves and then to all of the various cockpit components. With the interior green down, I continue to build up layers of color by next applying an oil wash made from a mixture of raw umber and a drop of flat black thinned with mineral spirits. I apply this to all of the cockpit parts and allow it to flow into all of the various panel lines and around all of the raised detail to add a good bit of depth to the finished look. I like to use old water bottle caps to mix small amounts of oil wash or paint for brush painting. 
When the oil washes dry, I come back in with the lightened interior green made by mixing in more yellow zinc chromate and spray this on the cockpit parts. I avoid the areas where the wash had settled in in order to really start bringing out the details in all of those parts. I put more paint in the center of the panels or other areas in order to have a progression of dark to light. The back side of the rudder pedals was natural metal, so I masked off those areas and sprayed a coat of aluminum using AK's Extreme Metal. While I had that color loaded up in the airbrush, I also painted the ammunition cans that mount to the firewall. I removed the tape from the rudder pedal housing and touched up a few of the areas that had overspray on them using Vallejo acrylics applied with a fine tip brush. To add some more chipping effects to the interior components, I thought I'd try the sponge technique. Just rip a small section of fine grain sponge and using tweezers, dab it in a color that's a little lighter than the base paint shade. It's like dry brushing, so just make sure to remove almost all of the color prior to dabbing it on the model parts. Just take your time and dab the sponge along the edges where chipping and wear would likely have been seen. It's better to have to add more chipping than get too much by using a fully loaded sponge. I wanted to try to build up even more weathering effects, so after I was done with the chipping, I added some AK Interactive panel line wash to the parts. I used their wash for winter camouflage as it has a nice greenish hue to it. I allowed it to dry and then using some clean white spirits, blended it into the paints to create shadows and grime. As I mentioned when I showed the kit contents, the harnesses and belts on the seat looked a little weak and underrepresented. So using pewter foil and thin solder wire, I made new ones and installed them onto the seat using super glue. I've got a more detailed video that shows that process loaded up here on the channel if you want to check that out later. Just like I had done with the other cockpit parts, I painted the seat flat black and then followed that up with a coat of interior green. I installed the seat into the cockpit and then used the same weathering processes to add more dimension to the overall finished look. I used Vallejo acrylics for the detailed painting of the various subcomponents in the cockpit. For the map case, I first painted the light leather brown color. In much the same way, I painted the instrument panel using flat black, lightened with just a touch of flat white. That way, I could add drops of flat black back to the gauges themselves to make them stand out a little. To help make the parts a little more 3D-ish, I highlighted the edges with a cream color. To add shadow effects, I used a thin flat black around the edges. For the belts and harnesses, I used a custom mix of light khaki gray, making the belts just a little darker than the harnesses. For the buckles, I used Model Master's Chrome Silver. I used a fine tip brush and Vallejo White to paint the marks on each of the instrument gauges. To represent the glass bezels, I mix up 5 minute epoxy and using a toothpick, dab a little on each gauge. Here's a look at the completed cockpit and forward gun sections with everything built, painted, and glued in place. Despite its age, the kit parts still fit together really well. The cockpit and gun assembly fits onto the large locating lug on the right side of the fuselage. I glued it in place using more of that Tamiya Superfine Thin Cement. Now I knew the Aracobra was going to be a tail sitter and it would be tough to get enough weight into the nose. But I had to try since I wasn't about to have the model displayed with the clear stand that Monogram provides in the kit. I used BBs and lead fishing weights packed where I could in the nose areas and glued them in place with that 5 minute epoxy. I'm just hoping that I added enough weight to prevent the model from sitting on its tail. These old school kits always seem to be designed in the same way in terms of installing the landing gear and gear doors. Most times they have to be installed during the build unless you want to modify the design a little. Installing them during the build does make painting and handling a bit more challenging but nothing too bad when it comes to the P39 nose gear 
so I just figured I'd install it now. Before I do though, I apply a coat of interior green, but lightened it up a good bit with more yellow zinc chromate. I apply drops of Tamiya cement into each of the locating holes for the nose gear and gear doors. Then I just pop them into place. With the nose gear and gear bays installed, the fuselage halves can be joined. The overall fit is really good, and more Tamiya cement helps join things securely and quickly. Here's how things are looking with the fuselage pretty well wrapped up. I did install those left side engine exhaust stacks so that I wouldn't forget those when attaching the wing. I left it unpainted as it would be easily painted and weathered after I paint the entire airframe. While the fit of the fuselage halves is quite good, I still needed to sand the seams using the 220-400 sanding pad. After sanding, I did notice that that front fuselage joint did need a little filler, so I masked off both sides of the seam and applied a little Tamiya Superfine surface putty using a scrap piece of plastic sheet as a spatula. The tape helps to keep the filler from getting all over the surrounding surfaces. I didn't like that the gun ports were fared over, so I used successively larger drill bits to hollow those out and provide a little more realism. The final step was to use a round file to clean out those ports and ensure a smooth finish. Most P39s I see in the reference books have the swiveling nose wheel angled to one side or the other. I think this kind of thing adds just a little extra visual interest to the model, so I wanted to incorporate that feature on this build. I used a razor saw to cut the gear door just above the oleo scissors. Once I had the lower piece separated, I would be able to come back in later and drill a small hole in both sections of the nose wheel and insert a metal pin to allow the nose wheel to swivel. With the filler dry, I use that sanding pad again to sand and polish the upper fuselage seam. I attach the right and left horizontal stabilizers that have the built-in elevators. I then assemble the bottom half of the wing to the fuselage. Again, the fit here is really good with only a few little gaps at the joints. The way the wing mounted machine gun attaches is kind of like that nose gear. They are made to be installed before putting the top halves of each wing in place. But I don't like that idea, as I for sure will break them off as I handle the model during painting and final assembly. So I added some small sections of evergreen square rod to the back end of the tubes to serve as a backstop for the machine guns. This will allow me to slide them in later after I finish with everything else. With those installed, I can now add the right and left top wing halves to the lower wing. These are secured in place with more of that Tamiya cement and allowed to cure. There are a few areas that needed a little filler at the trailing and leading edges, so I filled those with more Tamiya putty. I gave all of the seams a good sanding using that 400 grit pad in preparation for painting the airframe. When painting multicolored models, it's always best to paint in order of light to dark. So I start out by first laying down a coat of Tamiya neutral gray to the under surfaces. The actual color was a lighter bluish gray, but the dark neutral gray helps to provide some depth as I lighten the shade in the successive steps. I'm spraying with a Badger Velocity Renegade with a 0.2 millimeter nozzle and at about 17 PSI. I like to keep the patterns a little tight so that I build color up a little at a time and have more control over the finish. I start to lighten and change the tone by adding a little white and light blue to the mix and thinning that out with more Tamiya acrylic thinner. This mixture is sprayed inside of the various panel lines to start building some depth in the finish. I repeat this step, adding more thinner, white, and light gray, and then spraying that into select panels for more variation of tone. I lighten things up one last time and now focus that spray on small access panels and the fabric covered ailerons. For the top side earth color, I mixed up a custom mix using Tamiya Earth and NATO Brown. I used references as a guide to freehand the basic outline of the earth color. After I have the basic outline down, I open up the brush and fill in those areas.
As I make my way over the fuselage and all those open areas, I lay down a little Tamiya tape to mask off the open areas and prevent overspray. When I have all the basic earth color down, I do the same thing that I did with the underside color and lighten it up in phases. First, I add a little Tamiya Deck Tan to the mixture along with more thinner and spray that inside various panels to give a more weathered look. I come back in and add a little more Deck Tan and repeat the steps again. With the brown down, I use Tamiya RAF Dark Green for the topside green color. I freehand the camo pattern using reference illustrations as a guide. I first outline the basic patterns and then come back in and fill in those outlined areas. I work one section at a time until all of the base green color is applied. Just like I had done with the gray and the brown, I lighten up the green a little and thin it out even more and spray the mixture inside of various panels. I wasn't quite happy with the shade of the brown after I had the green down, so I mixed up another custom mixture, this time adding a little yellow zinc chromate to change the overall hue a bit. This was sprayed inside of the various panels. Here's how it looked with the primary colors down. I masked off the wingtip areas and used Tamiya Flat White to spray those. Now these next steps are a bit tedious, but to me, they really add life to some of the older kits with raised panel lines. I start with a little of that AK panel line wash for winter camouflage and apply it with a thin brush over the various raised and recessed panel lines. I work in small sections, letting it dry for a few minutes and then removing the wash with a clean brush and clean white spirits. As I go, I wipe off the excess dark wash on a clean paper towel. You can see how it really starts highlighting the surface details when I finish up the undersurface of the right wing. To start adding even more effects and some additional contrast, I come in with some white oil paint right out of the tube and apply it to the inside of a few selected panels. I come back in right away with that clean brush and more clean white spirits and blend and remove that white oil paint. You can now see how it starts to create some highlights at the leading edge of various panels and on the underside of the right wing. Now let's compare the before and after. You can see the extra detail that is achieved versus paint alone when comparing the left side to the right side. I keep working in this way until the entire undersurface has been weathered. Here's what it looks like at that point as compared to the upper surfaces, which just have the paint applied without the additional oil weathering effects. Now it's a little stark for some, and in this case, even for me. And to tone it down just a bit, I mix up a really thin mixture of Tamiya light gray, white, and light blue, and then overspray the panel lines to tone things down a bit. I remask the wingtips so I don't get overspray on those white areas. The top side weathering is performed in the exact same way. First, the dark oil wash along the panel line areas is applied, allowed to dry, and then blended and removed. The really good thing about this technique is that it is super flexible. You can use a variety of colors and leave or remove as much or as little as you like to achieve the look that best suits your personal modeling preferences. 
Here's a look at the model after I had the dark wash applied and removed from the top side surfaces. To add those highlights on the earth tones, I mixed up a little yellow ochre and white to create a shade that was sufficiently lighter than the base color. Just like the undersurfaces, I applied that to the various panels to represent some light reflection and fading. And just like before, those oils were blended into and removed from the base colors until I was happy with the overall effect. For the green, I mixed up some olive green oil paint with a little yellow ochre and white to create a custom shade I wanted. I applied and removed this shade in the same way as I had done with the others, making sure to keep my brush and white spirits clean along the way by removing the excess with that clean paper towel. When complete, things look a little overdone, but once again, I'll tone those down with a quick and easy coat of the base colors. I remixed some of the earth tone and sprayed those areas and then followed that up with the RAF dark green, taping off those white wing tips to protect them as I went along. Here's how things looked up to this point. The paint and weathering are complete, and I'm pretty happy with the overall look so far. One good thing about the old kits is that they usually have features like these wing walks actually molded into the kit plastic. This makes masking and painting a breeze. I used more Tamiya low-tack tape to mask those off and then spray both sides with a coat of Tamiya NATO Black. To create some chipping effects, I used the same sponge technique that I did for the cockpit. This time, using a little neutral gray, I removed most of it by pouncing it on a clean sheet of white paper. When I was happy that most of it had been removed, I blotted it over the wing walk areas to create a subtle chipped effect. In preparation for decaling, I applied a liberal coat of AK's Real Gauzy over the entire model. I really like this product as it's self-leveling and I've never had any adverse reaction between it and any of the decal setting solutions that I've used so far. I let that gauzy cure for a few hours before adding any decals. I was really worried about how these 50 year old decals would perform, but hey, the rest of the kit's been good so far, so let's just give them a try. There's a lot of extra carrier film around them so I tried to trim each as close to the actual decals as possible. I'll start with my favorite decal, that shark mouth, and we'll see how well it performs. I used a little AK decal setting solution to help these old decals settle down to the model surface. After dipping each decal in hot water, I apply them to the model surface, move them into position with a paintbrush or tweezers, and then add another coat of decal setting solution over the top. Even after 50 years, the decal still performed extremely well. I continue using the same steps to apply all of the markings, including the insignias, serials, US lettering, and those unique markings like the rooster on each door and the Hell's Bells on the upper engine covers. While the decal's set up, I switch over and paint and assemble the prop and spinner. I painted the prop using Tamiya Flat Black and the spinner with Tamiya White. I masked and painted the tips of the prop using Tamiya Flat Yellow over a primer coat of flat white. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to pose that nose wheel in an angled position, so I cut the nose gear just above the oleo. I used a small pin vise to drill holes in both sides of the gear so that I could install a small metal pin. I used super glue to attach the pin and to assure that the upper and lower gear sections would be attached securely to hold the weight of the finished model. Since I didn't mask off the main gear bays while airbrushing the undersurfaces, I had to come back in and mask around them so that I could respray the wheel bays with a lightened mixture of that interior green. I removed the mask and then installed the main gear to both the right and left side. I decided to install them and then weather and detail them in place. One thing about these old decals that didn't work quite as well as I had hoped was that yellow color was a little translucent. To fix this, I mix up a little Vallejo flat yellow 
and just repainted the rooster's tail and the surround around the hell's bells to make those stand out a little better. I cut canopy masks using Tamiya tape. I have another video up on the channel that better describes this process, so make sure to check that out when you can. I first apply a coat of the interior cockpit color over the canopy frames that will represent the color of the frames when viewed from the inside. Next, I apply a coat of earth color and then follow that up with the RAF dark green. I make sure that they are aligned appropriately with the color demarcations on the fuselage. I give the frames a coat of AK's ultra matte varnish before removing the masks to show the crisply painted canopy frames. I'll install these using more of that Tamiya super thin cement. Again, it's pretty amazing how well these parts fit to the airframe given the age of this kit. To add a little more wear and chipping effects around some of those panels on the fuselage and wings, I mix up a thin and lighter shade of the base earth and green colors. I apply this randomly using a thin brush to various panels, around rivets, and along areas that would have likely seen a lot of traffic due to access or routine maintenance. I used Easy Line to make the antenna. It's a great product since it's very flexible and stretchy, so you don't have to worry about damaging it if you accidentally push it while you're handling the model. I attach each end using a small drop of super glue with a stretch sprue applicator. There's another video for those applicators up here on the channel. Make sure to check that out. Finally, I painted and installed the wing machine guns and pitot tube to finish out this blast from the past build. Here's a look at the finished model. I wanted to build another classic kit, and for me, they don't get much better than the 148th Monogram P39 Aero Cobra. It was really fun to revisit this kit since it was my all time favorite growing up, and it was a great way to reconnect with my modeling experiences that I had when I was a kid. Even though this kit is almost 60 years old, it's still a great kit and a lot of fun to build. Again, I appreciate you tuning back into the Flying S Models channel and hope that you found this video informative and fun. Thank you for your continued support to our little community here and make sure to subscribe and click the notifications bell to keep up with my latest video updates. We'll see you next time.